Hello everybody, my name is Jimmy Smith and welcome to the Wine with Jimmy channel. Um, thank you so much for watching the video. This is our third part of the Sherry series for the WSET Level 4 Diploma. And this is going to focus on the vineyard, so climate, weather, geology, soils, uh, and things like vineyard management. Lots of good videos in here and lots of pictures to help you understand for your level three diploma, level four diploma, I am sorry. So uh, so yes, um, please at any time, um, pop in some comments and questions. Uh, I'd love to hear from you um, below this video. And this is the third part of a multi-part series. This is free content on YouTube and the latter end of the series will be only available for members on the e-learning portal, which is available with winewithjimmy.com. Great. So um, the third part, as mentioned, so this follows on from part two. And part two we did last time was looking at wine laws and business. So the sales of sherry. We were sadly a little bit negative about sherry because we had to be due to the lack of sales, the decline of sales over the recent years. In fact, from 20, uh, 2006 to 2016, a lot of sherry is decreasing by about 40, 45%, which is dramatic. And we mentioned quite a bit that that's due to the fact that it's a bit of an old uh, and outdated drink for many people. Um, they have tried to diversify for the younger generation, but it hasn't always worked. So there has been a few issues, of course, and with big, big drop in sales, comes a lot of problems. I wanted to show you a quick video, which is quite fun, uh, which is from one of my favorite movies. It's a 15 second clip uh, from With Nail and I, which really um, solidifies and embodies that kind of old school nature to Sherry that we were talking about uh, on, uh, on session two. So let's uh, pop this in and have a look. I just think it's a very funny scene. It's a bit blurry, um, but you'll get to the, uh, the speech of this. Uh, which is great. Uh, so this is Uncle Monty and With Nail and I from the movie With Nail and I. Uh, Would you like a drink? Sure. 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 And it kind of just sort of embodies that, right? It's that kind of sherry, sherry, sherry. It's very, very classic, very old school. Um, now, you know, you know full well that there are some fantastic sherries out there. And in fact, it is um, engaging the younger audiences today, but you still can't account for the very dramatic drop in sales of sherry, which has been quite significant. So just a funny little start there that links into part two. So let's get on with part three. So looking at the vineyard in that picture, quite a wonderful typical view of a vineyard in the uh, production zone of sherry. So there's some wonderful um, high density plantation on the very white chalk laden Albarizia soils there. So that's wonderful light reflection and good water storage capability on a slope, which is very typical, a sort of a 15 degree slope, very typical. If you have any um, comments or questions and you want to put them through social media, please do. At the bottom of every slide, you'll see my uh, handles through uh, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. So that's at Wine with Jimmy, the Wine Schools, and my Wine Bar, all in London, in the United Kingdom. So here, we're looking at the autonomous region of Andalusia in the south of Spain. So this is on the border of Portugal to its westerly side. The north is on Extremadura and then Castilla-La Mancha, and then down to the east on Murcia. And then in the southern section and the southwesterly section, we're looking at the Mediterranean and of course the Atlantic. Um, so this region, um, is at quite a low latitude. So if we draw a nice big line through here, let's do that now, um, the latitude of this coming through here is about 36 degrees, okay? So that's 36, uh, uh, we're talking north. So that means that um, we are in the borders of 30 to 50, north, but it is much more towards the equator side of things. So, of course, this will uh, equate to much warmer conditions at 36 north. Uh, so, yes, it is a very warm zone. Uh, it's a Mediterranean climate with very hot and dry summers, and then the winters uh, tend to be mild, 
um, with some good rain, actually. The rainfall tends to be quite concentrated between around October to May. Uh, so you'll find a fair bit of rainfall. It's not the highest, um, but you will find that there's a fair bit of it in winter. And soils need to be able to store that rainfall for the very dry summers. And we'll talk about that later. Altitude in this area for us, which is down in the southwesterly part, that is where we find Jerez, the region of Jerez, um, that is at quite low altitude, up to about 100 metres, but down to zero, down to, of course, um, sea level, uh, um, of course, because it's right on the coastal area. Um, and yes, it has influences from the Atlantic, and we'll show that on the next slide, as well as influences from the Mediterranean. So here is a closer look at the Jerez area, the zone of production of sherry. Uh, so it is pretty much bordered on the north area, and you can see where I'm pointing now into this area, the Guadalquivir River, which runs through Cordoba in the center part of uh, Andalusia and empties here into the Atlantic. Seville is off to the north, and then in the south uh, here, we will go down towards the Mediterranean. Of course, all this bluish area on the west is the Atlantic, uh, of course, which is very important here. The Atlantic then, let's talk a bit more about it. Let's draw in some nice blue arrows because this is what we need to know. So across here and affecting this whole area is a wind which comes off the Atlantic. And that wind is what we call the poinente wind, poinente. Um, this is a cool, um, humid wind, which really does mitigate the landscape, um, moderates it during the very hot summer months. It's, um, it's quite deceptive. If you're on the beach on the Bay of Cadiz, you can feel it, you actually feel in summer, it's pretty chilly due to that wind, but it really is quite sunny on the converse as well. So the poinente wind, it's really important for two reasons. Firstly, in the vineyard for actually um, cooling down the vines themselves, which means they don't over ripen. And then in the winery, where in the bodegas, the cold wind is trapped to actually moderate the temperatures within the bodegas. It's a very important wind, but it's not all just wonderful cooling breezes. There of course are some warming winds as well, which don't come from the Atlantic, but they come from the other side, though, so therefore from the southeast. And this is the Levant, so it comes from the Mediterranean. So let's pop this down here at the bottom, and it's all in red. So that is quite a warming wind, this one. Um, and when it blows, it can create a more arid kind of environment around the vineyard, causing the grapes to transpire more quickly, sort of evaporate and that can concentrate the grape sugars. Too much sugar can be negative because it may actually uh, produce far too much sugar, be uh, difficult to fully ferment, so that might leave sugar behind, which can then cause problems later with the development of floor yeast, which of course is what we do want for sherry production where most of its flavor and aroma comes from. Um, so we'll talk a bit more about that uh, when we talk about winemaking. Jerez uh, and the region around it experiences a lot of sunshine due to that 36 degrees north in latitude. You're talking over 3,000 hours of sunlight per year, and that's a lot of cloud-free skies, lovely blue skies in this area, very, very sunny zone. And of course, that means plenty of uh, capability for ripening. Um, but there are issues with that. It's so sunny that grapes can become sunburnt, certainly with reflection from the white chalky soil. So you'll have to take steps in the vineyard, such as higher trained vines and shading to, to protect those grapes. On the left hand side are the three towns which make the zone of the Cliantha, the aging zone. Sherry must be aged in one of these three towns, which we'll talk about later when we go through the maturation section. So that is San Luca de Barrameda, Jerez de la Frontera, and then El Puerto de Santa Maria. Uh, we'll talk about those on another future session, however. So here are the production zones again, of which you will need to have a bit of information about. So this is what we call the zone de production, uh, or the production zone, and it's the same kind of, but a slightly better map than the one before it. 
Um, as we can see, we have the Guadalquivir River, which is on the kind of northern border of it, um, the province of Sevilla. We have the Guadalete River that runs through the middle and empties out at El Puerto de Santa Maria. Um, we have, of course, of the Atlantic on the western side. The size of the vineyards is almost 7,200 hectares, according to the 20. 18 figures. You may also hear this uh, zone sometimes called the Maca de Jerez uh, as well. Um, so the grapes must be grown within this zone if they want to be classified as one of these stamps on the bet bottom left of the uh, of the slide. So of course this is Jerez, Sherry. This is the Man Manzanilla de San Luca de Barrameda, which comes from this um, the estuary part of the Guadalquivir River, but also vinegar from this area. Um, don't worry about that so much. But these are the three permitted um, from grapes sourced from this zone of production of around 7,200 hectares in total. Um, there is one exception to the rule. Pedro Jimenez, the grape Pedro Jimenez, can actually be sourced from Montilla. So Montilla Moridesh, which is from um, uh, north of Malaga within the Cordoba zone. So the grapes can come from there and then be uh, brought here where they'll have to be um, uh, matured within this zone. That was uh, talked a little bit about on part two in the wine laws and business. Um, so there, uh, this zone of production also is split into two parts, the Jerez Superior and the Jerez Zona. Uh, the superior, which is the better sites, uh, the darker shades uh, in this, sorry, the lighter shades in this one, tends to be the better vineyard sites, normally located on Albarizia, the top white chalky soils. Uh, and it makes around 90% of the plantations in the, uh, in the Jerez Superior. Um, great, so that's your production zones of the area. Let's have a look at a Google video here. Let me just get the code for it, which I will pop in uh, just now. Uh, and this is just so we can get an idea. Oh, we need to get rid of that. Uh, somehow, close, here we go. Uh, here we go. Aha. So let's just get a feel of a Google Earth 3D video so you can understand uh, what it looks like in this area. Uh, it's only a couple of minutes. There is the Iberian Peninsula, including Spain, of course, and Portugal. And as we head to Andalusia, in that southern section here, we can see some cities have been uh, highlighted. They're a little bit blurry at the minute, but we are going closer here to Jerez de la Frontera, which is that major town, one of the Zona de Crianza, one of the maturing towns. And around it, you can see many vineyards uh, dotted around that area. There is the center of Jerez de Frontera, very famous, of course, indeed. Wonderful ferias, the big fairs and festivals here, uh, all related with sherry. But around this area, you can see the vineyards in the Zona de Producción, uh, and uh, of course, uh, in, the, in, the, in areas like them, um, yeah, Jerez Superior. Um, so that is Jerez de la Frontera. I think we're going to look at a few other little bits now as well. Ah, good. We're going up to the, this is the river called the uh, Guadalquivir River, uh, which comes from Cordoba and empties here. And we're looking at some vineyards around here because we're focusing now on San Luca. So this is San Luca de Barrameda, which is the northern coastal town on the estuary of the Guadalquivir River. And this is famous, of course, for Manzanilla. I think we'll talk about later on in the uh, um, in the sherry presentations. So that's all we're going to look at there. Let's go back to our presentation. Here we go. Wonderful. So just giving you a bit of an idea of the landscape with that video. OK, next up then is uh, geology of this landscape. So, of course, the key soil. There are actually three soils here in Jerez, and the key one is Albariza. Alba means white. So, of course, this soil is a very white soil. Uh, this is a, a mixture of um, clay and silica. Clay is very water retentive. Silica is a mineral, very abundant mineral in the earth. Uh, quartz, it gives you a bit of a sparkle. But then chalk. So chalk is a type of limestone, and this accounts for about 30 to 80 percent of Albariza, a little bit like the soils in uh, Chablis, for instance. Um, and it is very key. That, that chalk is very key. 
um, but also the clay we'll need to talk about as well. Let's go through, excuse me, let's go through the key characteristics of this. So in this area, um, we can have um, very high planting densities, uh, and that is possible uh, due to the fact that there is um, good water availability due to this soil. So in the rest of Spain, when you go to places like Castilla La Mancha, Castilla Leon, you know, the very arid central continental Spain, it is an area of very low density plantation due to the scarcity of water supply. But here you can have very high density plantations. Um, so often up to sort of 7,000 to 10,000 vines per hectare. Um, this means you can have fairly decent yields from it as well, often around 60 to 70 hectolitres per hectare. The maximum permitted is 80. Uh, they don't normally get that high, but still very high permitted possible ones. Uh, so this uh, is possible due to the fact that we have this quite high water retention from the clay content in the Albarizia soils which stores the water from those winter rainfalls, which uh, are anywhere from October through to May. And that means that the vine can tap into that during the very dry and arid summer months. Um, also during the summer months, uh, you get this uh, really sort of thick, crusty layer that is found on top of the albarice, which acts as a buffer to keep in the moisture which has been stored there so it doesn't evaporate. So therefore it really reduces that evaporation, meaning the roots can find that water as they need to. Uh, so very, very useful indeed. And then finally, I think the next thing is about the colour. Uh, so we uh, we have a very white chalky soil. It's full of uh, that high limestone content, so chalk, uh, and that gives you light reflection, which aids ripening, of course. So this is very, very useful indeed to ripen your grapes. Um, then I think that's about it. Ah, we have one more fact here as well, which will pop just here. There is a process um, called banking up. And as you'll see here, I mean, this is actually quite low density plantation in that picture, but ignore that for now. But you'll see that there have been kind of like ditches uh, that have been dug. Um, so they, they kind of move the soil. And, and this is done pretty much uh, throughout um, uh, throughout the sort of uh, uh, um, spring time. So, uh, so, so during winter time. So maximizing the intake of this winter rain. So this is done during winter. Um, and when it rains, it actually forms in these little troughs or these, uh, these little um, uh, ditches. And then that will then seep into the ground. It's very useful. It uh, basically diminishes water runoff. Uh, and then um, as the vine then springs into life in that spring, they uh, smooth out the soil so it's no longer banked up. It's called aspiado uh, in Spanish or alambrado as well. You may find it written as as well. We'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. Um, oh, just another quick video now as well. Uh, so we can get an idea of what the albarite soil looks like in a video. So let's go to that. Let's close that down. Uh, back to this. Here we go. Voila. So this is a, a very short video of just a bit of, um, uh, it's it's not hand steady, I apologize for that, but uh, this is uh, within the zone of production, it's a 40 second, and as you can see here, um, this is towards the end of the year, uh, vines are very healthy, grapes are looking very big, but the soil at the bottom there is that brilliant white chalky Albarizia soils. You will very much need to know about that. It's commonly included in examinations talking about what it's like, what it's composed of, the benefits of it and drawbacks of it as well, such as reflection, which can cause sunburn. Um, but you can see that it's very well suited to this region where water is needed to be stored due to that clay content, which is found within the soil and a wonderful sort of uh, panoramic shot there of the vineyards as well. Okay, great. Um, other soil types here as well. So um, and really, to be honest, your soils here are majority albaritia, but you will find there is some arinash and barosh as well. 
Arena soils are sort of yellowish reddish. You'll see in that picture is much more reddish on the left hand side. Have about 10% chalk, uh, difficult to spot within that picture. Um, but they are common in coastal areas, specifically south of San Luca around a town called Chipiona, which is common therefore for muscat. Muscat is found in Arinash soils quite a lot. They don't hold water very well, so therefore not suited to Palomino. Barosh on the right hand side there is a much darker soil, has 10% chalk again, but has more clay and more organic matter, hence why it's darker. It looks very sort of full of organic matter. Um, they're fertile, of course, with that organic matter, but more difficult to work. You find them at the foot of hills, near rivers and streams, um, and uh, the quality tends to, tends to be a little bit lower from grapes produced in Barosh, uh, so that's why it's not used as much. Um, you won't find them being suitable for Finos, um, and Barosh uh, really was an expansion zone. As sherry really quickly grew after the Second World War, they started planting all over the place to suit demand. And that meant that not all uh, vineyards were found on Albarizia. So Barosh was selected next. So this is actually falling out of favor now as decline, uh, sherry is going through quite a large decline. So that's why you find very limited amounts of Barosh today. So let's look at our key grape varieties of the area. Um, so three major grape varieties of the region. Of course, we talk about Palomino, first of all. Um, Palomino may be also considered um, as Palomino Fino and also Listan. Um, you must remember and when we talked about the history section of Sherry, that down here is a, was a really important area for the expansion of the Spanish Empire with great seafarers like Christopher Columbus and Magellan leaving from the shores of Andalusia, uh, from Cadiz and Huelva. Uh, they headed towards their first stopping point, the Canary Islands, before then Magellan heading south towards the Cape, Southern Cape, South Africa, and uh, Columbus heading towards uh, the middle of the Americas. Um, the grape was called Listan, uh, in uh, in the Canary Islands and then was transported around the world. So Listan is, is much more its Canary Islands name, making some phenomenal volcanic white wines from that uh, collection of islands. Um, so it's 99% Palomino of sherry production by volume, probably about 95% of the vineyards, but the volume is fairly large. Large yielding, mid to late ripening uh, and suited to those dry sunny conditions. It can be quite low in acidity. As it gets to ripeness, the acidity can quickly drop off. So in this instance, often you will find that the musts of Palomino will be acidified with tartaric acid. Um, not all of them, certainly not from the greatest sites, uh, sites and the most quality conscious uh, grape growers. Um, but also the last thing to mention is Palomino is a remarkably neutral variety. Um, one of the reasons why it's being phased out of certain parts of Spain. So, for instance, in Rueda, up in the Castilla Leon area of Spain towards the north. Um, but it doesn't matter because you do not need an aromatic variety because the majority of Sherry's flavors comes from the maturation and blending stage. So all of that floor influence and oxidation. So that is absolutely fine for it being a neutral variety. Next up then is your Pedro Jimenez or PX as it's written sometimes as well. Um, now this can be sourced from the zone of production but remember it can also be sourced from Montilla Morores which is in the Cordoba area so north of Malaga. Um, so you may find it from there in fact there's a fair bit of it from that area. Um, now this is a thin skin grape variety which can accumulate quite high levels of uh, 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 alcohol, so sugar and alcohol. It's ideal for the sun drying process, which we call the Saleo process. And it's another neutral variety. It's gonna get most of its flavor from the drying process and the uh, Solera system again. It's used for sweet wine production, but also Pedro Jimenez will be made into a sweet component to be blended into Palomino to add sugar for more premium sweetened sherries. Uh, so it can be quite important less than 1% of the total production volume, of course. Um, there is a picture of the Saleo process. Uh, you'll see that 
Pedro Jimenez grapes here have been picked and laid out in the sunshine in these um, either sort of uh, um, cloth mats or, or baskets where they will evaporate their water content and thus concentrating the sugar. And this, of course, will therefore make remarkably sweet product afterwards if it's going to be made into a wine or as a sweetening agent. Uh, so that's obviously dramatically decreasing the volume. And then the last grape variety, which is less than 1% again by volume, is the Moscatel grape. Otherwise, you might see it written as Muscat of Alexandria. Um, it's also called Muscatel de Scipiona because the town where we find a lot of it on the uh, Arinish uh, soils is, uh, and you see the brownish shade there, is around Scipiona. So there's a fair bit of it there, making quite grapey, sweet and aromatic wines. It's late ripening, as muscats tend to be, and it's quite adapted to the heat and drought. That's why we tend to find muscat of Alexandria across the sort of southern section like here, but also the eastern Mediterranean. So Valencia, for instance, and Murcia. Um, very aromatic, as one would expect, uh, but very small production volumes of it. Now, let's talk a little bit about the vineyard management of, um, of Sherry. And let's talk, first of all, about this. This is the Varia so Varia Pulga. This is an old traditional method which is being phased out as Sherry modernizes for mechanization, but we still find it. Uh, so you have a picture on the left of the Pulga, which is the thumb and then the va vara, which is the stick. So this is the thumb and stick, or the stick and thumb uh, uh, um, method. So each vine is raised with two important branches, um, and the production will alternate between those. So in this one, you've got a right-hand branch, which is resting on the stick. Um, the left-hand one will actually be for the for, uh, uh, future year after this one. Um, so it alternates between those two. Uh, so one year, usually in January, they cut back the left branch and have a small shoot with just one or two uh, uh, buds, and that is the thumb. The right branch, um, the long stick or vara, it, it has seven or eight buds to it. And of course, this is where the grapes will come from. Um, but as I mentioned, an increasing amount of vineyard today are not now cordon trained and not vara e pulga, more cordon trained. And that's for um, mechanization. So these are forms of VSP, vertical shoot positioning. Uh, and that's a, a more modern method of it. We find our vineyards on slopes, of course. And this is the same picture as the holding first picture of the presentation. Uh, they are generally planted on gentle 10 to 15 percent gradient slopes. And that's where you tend to find the Albariziat soils as well. I mentioned earlier that the maximum yields from these vineyards are 80 hectolitres per hectare. They don't tend to get that high. They're normally between sort of 60 and 70 in the region. Um, we looked at this and talked about this also earlier as well. Each year after the harvest, so when the vine is uh, going into its dormant uh, season. The soil is worked uh, to create a series of troughs, as you can see here. And this uh, is in order to capture the winter rain so it seeps into the soil and doesn't go down the slope as surface runoff. Um, so that is important. So as we mentioned earlier, uh, very important to capture that, um, that winter rain. Rootstocks uh, here as well. The most widely used are the three listed here. As you know, rootstocks don't have very romantic, historical or sexy names, but we have the triple three EM, we have 41B and 13.5 FX. These are all Vitis vinifera um, with Berlanderi hybrid rootstocks, which of course a lot of um, American vines are used for. Um, the, the last one of this, which is the EVEX, was developed by a local viticultural research station and is in fact been found to be the most successful to date. It's tolerant of the limestone, uh, which means that chlorosis is not an issue, and it's also very tolerant of drought producing good yields, which is important in this region. Um, the harvest, uh, harvest time, of course, 
uh, here is actually quite early because of the amount of sunlight. Um, harvest will begin in the first week of August often and ending in the um, second week of September. So it's sort of spreading around four to six weeks. The latter areas will be coastal zones, the cooler coastal zones like Chipiona and uh, places like San Luca de Barameda, Puerto de Santa Maria, all of those areas will be picked in September, but the inland areas will tend to be a little bit more towards August. Harvest will tend to be early as possible um, as remember, there are those autumnal rains which can happen due to its proximity next to the ocean. Uh, and any kind of form of rot will be very detrimental to the quality, certainly for biologically aged wines under floor. We'll talk about that on future uh, presentations. Um, the alcohol potential was normally around 11.5 to 12 percent. The total grams per litre of acidity is five. It's not the highest. If it does get a little bit too low, remember that will be corrected in the winery and the pH of the wine will be at a, an area of around 3.3 to 3.5, uh, which is underneath the magic 3.6 number, uh, which means it will be able to go through all the processes it needs to. Um, so the later harvest grapes will be PX and Muscatel, um, and that's because of the desirable amount of extra sugar that is needed. Uh, and machine harvesting today is quite normal. It's actually about two thirds of the harvest is done by machine and normally in the early hours of the morning or the dead of night when it's a much cooler, of course. Um, so that is the end of this section, slightly longer than usual. I hope you have uh, found this very useful and enjoyable. Um, please, if you have any concerns, comments or questions, pop them in the comment section underneath this YouTube video. Otherwise, please get in contact via our social media channels, which are all at the bottom of the slides. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Please remember, if you're looking for more information, more video content exclusive for our members of the winewithjimmy.com e-learning portal, you can sign up and subscribe and you'll get access to those videos in advance members only videos, and of course, examination questions and alike. Thank you so much for your time, care and attention. I've been Jimmy Smith and see you very soon. Thank you.